Good is Terrence Doolin. Uh, Dr. Terrence Doolin, an orthomolecular biochemical nutritionist for over 30 years. He's been practicing for over 38 years and has treated over 50,000 individuals to date. His topic for today is methylation madness. Insight into the biochemical and personal lives of hypermethylators. So you a warm welcome to Dr. Terrence Doolin. Just two. Now, when you're only dealing with 
two. You're only looking at one part of the mechanism, not looking at the rest. Why aren't we looking at the other 18? Well, because nobody's done any research on the other. So therefore, you're not going to know what those other 18 actually do to anything. So when we talk about these things, MTHFR controls an enzyme. Okay, that's predominantly its function. Methyl tetrahydrofolic acid reductase. That's what it is. And in doing so, that changes part of the mechanism for folic acid. When you look at how folic acid would work, let me just shift to this, you can see that MTHFR is all the way on the corner here. And that's pretty much the main mechanism it does when you're looking at methylation of certain functions. You can see here is MTHFR, and it's moving this to this. You'll also notice there are other pathways involved with it at the same time that are backups and secondary systems to make sure that this is actually working correctly. For this MTHFR to work, these enzymes need to work. Those gene SNPs there, MTR and MTRR, are responsible for helping B12 metabolize, and that, in the end, makes methylene from homocysteine. That's all it's doing. The other part you need to really look at is methionine is a dietary amino acid. That dietary amino acid is necessary for the whole mechanism to work. You can't get it from just recycle, you must get it from your food. So diet becomes really important as to whether or not you have enough methionine in your system. Another part of that is you need to have ATP. If you don't have any ATP, you're not going to be able to activate SAMe. If you don't activate SAMe, you don't get any methylation. All the other enzymes become slower and sluggish and don't really turn around and function at their highest rate. There are lots of cofactors that we're going to talk about and pieces that we're going to look at and different enzyme systems that you can think about when you see your patient. We're going to approach this from a more clinical standpoint. Now, we're killing you with chemistry right now, but we'll get to the better parts, okay? Um, when you look at MAT1A, MAT1A is the gene that changes methionine into SAMe, otherwise known as S-adenosine methionine. SAMe is the major, most prevalent methyl donor in the human body. That's what it does. It basically donates methyl groups, goes down to S-adenosine homocysteine, to homocysteine and back up. Nice circle. It just keeps going round and round. The more food you put in that has methionine in it, things like fish, rice, peppers, onions, all of those are going to rapidly increase the amount of methionine in the system. So when you control your diet or you're looking at a methylation problem, you have to make sure that you know what foods you're giving that patient and whether or not that's contraindicated to everything you're doing. If you're throwing in a lot of uh, what's called methylcobalamin and methylfolate, you have to go with yourself, have I got enough substrate coming in in the way of foods given methionine to make this You also have to worry about methionine. It is known to be very toxic. Okay? If you build up 4% or more, in studies they've shown that will kill rats, it will destroy livers and things. So you don't want to have too much methionine in the system, but you want to have enough to keep the methylation systems running. Now, when you look here, you can see this is a put together structure piece that tells you what's going on with methylation. Here's your MTHFR, it cycles through. Here's your MTR and MTRR, that cycles through. And that takes homocysteine back up to the thiamine. The thiamine is coming in from your diet. That is the most important piece, making sure you have enough methionine in the system to actually make this happen. Now, the thiamine turns around, and when it moves to acidenosine, what it does is takes ATP out of the system. So people who don't have this enzyme working correctly are not going to be able to methylate, they're going to be exhausted. If you give them tons of methylcobalamin and methylfolate, what happens? They basically start to methylate, they pull all the ATP out, they feel great for a few days, and then all of a sudden, they're really tired, they're exhausted, they can't function, and they start taking it. That's the case because the other downwind enzymes are not being if you're not looking at those, and you're not looking at what they're going to do, then you're not 
to understand what methylation is doing. Okay? All the methylation reactions happen here between sanamine and acetanosol in the system. That is the home system. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'll talk closer. How's that? Sorry. <laughs> As you get to here, you get to homocysteine. Homocysteine, in fact, will turn around and recycle, or it will go down the pathways and make glutathione. So this is very important for your immune system activity. Okay. If you don't have glutathione production, you're going to end up giving tons of glutathione, but the person is going to not really improve tremendously because they're not making their own. If they're not making their own, you're going to have to chronically, never-endingly give them glutathione. And that's not only expensive, but it's counterproductive for the patient. So at this point, you want to say, here's B6 and CPS and CTH. These genes are basically controlling enzymes also. The enzymes that control the breakdown of homocysteine into glutathione, into other products. CPS and CTH are responsible for sulfur metabolism. Now, if you're not turning around and looking at that, maybe you think broccoli is really healthy. But if you happen to have a sulfur problem with a CPS gene or a CTH gene, those enzymes are not functioning correctly. Broccoli becomes your worst friend. Okay? It will turn around and back up in your system. Why? Broccoli's high in sulfur. Sulfur metabolism goes through these genes. So these are the things you need to look at. Now, we're talking a lot about genes, but you have to remember. The genes themselves are just the way that the DNA makes the enzyme. So every gene you see up there, okay, cystothionine beta synthetase, that basically is a gene that controls an enzyme, that controls a metabolism. That's the way you have to start thinking when you're dealing with MTHFR and methylation systems. You can't look at it as a single piece. Genetics and enzymes and chemistry are never a solo act. There is a course. You need to have all of them working together. And you need to look at all the downwind ones to really understand what's going to happen to your patient when you give or remove methionine, when you give or remove methylcobalamin and methylfolin. So this pretty much is giving you an idea of just these enzymes. There are other ones that shift things. And we'll get into some of those, and then they produce more symptoms and things of that nature, and that's what we're going to be looking at for most patient function. Uh -oh. <laughs> there we go. What is that? SHMT. SHMT is important because it's an enzyme that converts saline and glycine. If you remember back at the original chart, okay, methionine goes around, comes to basically homocysteine. Homocysteine then needs saline and vitamin B6 to actually be removed. So everybody's giving B6 because we've got to treat in any kind of CBS or CTH defects, any kind of sulfur methane. You have to treat that with B6. Well, that's great. But if there isn't enough serine in the system, then the B6 will not function, pull down that enzyme's activity, and get to the next stage. So these are, these are some of the things you've got to think in your head. What's going on and why? Back and forth, serine and glycine go. Well, what foods are we giving to them? Well, serine is really great loaded in coconut. So everybody who's eating coconut is great. It's pushing that. And it's basically getting this reaction to occur. However, coconut also turns around and pulls methionine out. So you don't have any acetaminophen methionine, and now what's going to happen? You're going to get tired. People are going to get more exhausted, and they're going to fall asleep. This is why serine is implicated in sleep, and this is why serine basically helps methylation when it's in a hyper state. When it's in a hypo state, and it's running very low. You're not going to be able to use serine because it's going to turn the person into a coma. They're going to be asleep most of the time. GNMT. This enzyme, okay, otherwise known as genetic gene, SNP, um, what it does is it turns around and it helps make a substance called creatine.
creatine is a major muscle activity. If you run blood workup or you see blood workup, you'll notice creatine is high in people who bodybuild or athletes. And that's because they're using their muscles extensively and they're producing a lot of creatine. It's also used as a kidney function test. If it's elevated with BUN, then you can have a kidney problem. But what if it's too low? What does that mean? Does it mean you have the greatest kidneys in the world? Or does it mean, pure and simple, this enzyme may not be working so well and you can't produce a lot of creatinine? If you can't produce a lot of creatinine, what happens? Your muscles get weak. They have no stamina. You lose your strength level. You see this with a lot of people that have chronic fatigues and other things. This gene adds to their symptomatology. It's not just the disease itself as much as it is what happens to the body. Does something shut this off? Is this already shut off when they get the disease? There's a whole different paradigm of looking at things because you have to look at it from a chemical standpoint and not just from a disease state. If you're only looking at it from a disease state, then you're looking for a bug. Well, this doesn't have a bug. It's no bug. What it is is a variant that's slowing it down. Genes are not on and off switches. If they are, they're usually not conducive with life when you don't live. They're more like volume dials. So some genes turn the volume all the way up, some genes turn the volume all the way down. When it turns it all the way down, that gene is functioning very, very sluggish. Can you correct it? Not really. What you can do is compensate for it. This is giving a person B6. This is a turning around and adding serine in abundance. All of these things affect how those genes and enzymes work. And that can get that enzyme up to maximum potential. Let's say this gene knocks down, and I'm gonna make up something arbitrary, creatinine production to 25%. Well, can you get it higher than that? No, the gene is not gonna allow the enzyme to do that. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to try to basically make sure the enzyme is always running at 25%. And that's how you're compensating for the gene malfunction. All of that helps your patient because now you've got a way to look at a blood work and say, oh, you know, that genes are off. That could be the problem. Let's look further into that. BHMT. BHMT is a BTM. Everybody think, remembers b team is being used, otherwise known as trimethylglycine, TMG. And then everybody uses that to bypass the problems with the MTHFR gene. And it does to a certain degree, unless it has variants and it's not working well. Then you're not going to recycle homocysteine with this particular gene. You're not going to turn around and bypass the MTHFR. And then the trimethylglycine is just going to sit in the system increase stomach acid, and that's pretty much what it's going to do. So when you're looking at this, um, pretty much people who want to use TMG, you need to know these genes before you even remotely think of getting it. TMG is a methyl donor. So you want to put that in? Sure. Does this mechanism work? Great. If it works, then that's going to help the patient. It's going to cycle the homocysteine. This is good for heart patients and things of that nature. If it's not going to work, then it's not going to go anywhere. GAMT. This is another one for creatinine. This is another one that changes that. Okay, all of these are specifics to turn around and create different effects in your system. This one everybody's going to love HNMT. HNMT is histamine methyltransferase. That's the enzyme. It's the most prevalent enzyme in your circulation to break down histamine. It's pretty much required for anaphylaxis, mast cells, all that. If this has variant, you're going to have problems with histamine removal on a regular basis. And you need to get histamine out of a person's diet. If you don't get it out of their diet, then this enzyme's not going to remove it fast enough, and they're going to start developing more and more allergic symptomatology. Rashes, hives, okay, um, anaphylaxis, all of that is directly related to this specific gene. Now, does this one help your stomach? No, that's another gene. Okay, there is a histamine gene called DAO, and that controls how your stomach breaks down histamine in there and lowers acid. This particular one is called body-wide, skin, 
bloodstream, all of those pieces. Peelant. Peelant is an interesting one, and it's what we started with. It affects neurotransmitters and neural hormone. Okay. Norepinephrine and epinephrine are part of your adrenal gland, not the cortisol side, because the adrenal gland has two sides. It has a cortex and a medulla. The cortex side is where you get cortisol and all of the sex steroids and those. The other side, the medulla side, is norepinephrine and epinephrine, which is neurotransmitter activity, um, heart rate controls, um, it controls things like blood pressure, it controls your peristalsis in your gut, it controls mood. If you have a problem here, too high for you and tea, you make a lot of adrenaline, those people get really pissed. A lot, really fast. If you empty too low and you produce less adrenaline, then you're going to be in what they call the fight or flight. You're going to have more anxiety, nervousness, worry, fear. So those are kind of things you can see right off. When you're looking at a person, if they're coming in with tons of anxiety, you probably should look at this gene. You probably should look for, basically, if you run blood, you should run epinephrine. You should run all of those to see if the person has had a problem with this gene. That produces those effects. It also, epinephrine is involved in histamine. Think EpiPen, okay, when somebody's having an allergic reaction, give a shot of epinephrine. Why? Well, the EpiPen is epinephrine, it's adrenaline, and what it does is it blocks the effect of histamine and brings down the histamine levels. It's supposed to do that naturally. If this gene is a problem, then you can't make adrenaline quick enough to balance off histamine. And that creates more allergic problems, even if you don't have an excessive amount of histamine in your system. So that's what makes these interesting to look at for your patient. This guy is not a methylating gene, but it is an enzyme that controls the production of niacin into NAD for your cytochromes and for your basic energy production in your mitochondria. And in MIT, when you eat any kind of niacinamide or niacin, this gene is required. Now, the NAD affects the methylation in another set of ways. The NAD affects the ATP production, which basically helps the ME turn around and becomes s dying. So all of these are important and interconnected and intertwined. That's why we kind of put that one out there. CoQ10. Everybody uses CoQ10 for mitochondrial function. If your patient really needs CoQ10, then what you're looking at here, CoQ3 and CoQ5 are biochemical steps in the production of CoQ10 from cholesterol. If these are not functioning, then you're not going to make CoQ10 effectively, and that's the third position in the cytokine. You're not going to make energy correctly. You don't make energy, your patient's going to be exhausted, tired. They're not going to have a lot of functional stamina with anything. And their biochemistry is going to run very slow. Here's an interesting one, AS3NT. This is a methylene enzyme again. It methylates, and what it does is it turns around and it basically helps in the removal of arsenic. Now, why would anybody want to know that? Well, if you have a population that has a high rice intake, arsenic is going to spray on rice as a uh, preventative from rats to eating it. If you have a high intake of that, and this gene is not functioning, you're going to see in your hair analysis and your blood overloaded levels of arsenic. And you're going to be like, is this person eating a thousand pounds of arsenic a day? Are they trying to be killed by somebody? No. This gene is not functioning subpar. The enzyme is subpar. And therefore, you cannot remove the arsenic from the system effectively. ASMT. This one has to do with another methylating enzyme, and it has to do with the production of melatonin. Melatonin is made from serotonin. This gene accomplishes that. If you don't have enough melatonin, then you have problems with sleep. Melatonin is also an antioxidant and does other things in the system, but it's predominantly known for sleep. So melatonin, if this is in hyperfunction, you don't have too much melatonin. People are going to be foggy, they're going to be tired all day, they're not going to be able to really function wonderfully. 
And all of these genes affect your patient's well-being. So you can have angry people, you can have people who have allergic reactions, you can have people who can't sleep. If this gene is functioning too much, then it's constantly removing serotonin from your system. These people will not only have sleep problems, they'll also have depression, anxiety, eating disorder type activities. All of these occur because this enzyme is not functional or over-functional. You always have to think that the enzyme can be up or down. COMT, this is the one everybody's chatting about these days, and all of the chat groups are just running all over the place. There are about 60 of these, and, and they're talking about you know, a handful, or you get a gene scan back, and there's one on there. That's not enough to understand. Remember, the methylation can affect one gene over here by upregulating, one gene over here by downregulating. So now you've got this imbalance that creates a unique person, but makes it harder to know what to do with methylation. Should you give methylation foods or not? Should you give methylation supplements or not? Will they make this person nuts or will they not make this person nuts? If the COMT isn't working right and it's very, very low, A, you're not going to basically be able to control neurotransmitter breakdown. B, you're not going to be able to detox in your phase two liver detox. So removing toxins and things that we tend to part. These people have problems with medications and drugs and all those kind of substances coming in. They can't get rid of them. And they sit in the system and they build up. And that's how you get drug interactions and drug reactions. COMT also breaks down hormones, testosterone and estrogen. People with fertility problems and people who have problems with their ability to get pregnant or people with testosterone is low, COMT is a lot, a lot of times a culprit. If it's hyperfunctional, the COMT will break down testosterone, estrogen twice as fast as it should, meaning you're always going to have hormone deficiencies. Okay? If the COMT is not working, then its low function is going to allow testosterone and estrogen to be incredibly high. And that for women, if you've got an exceptionally high estrogen, that usually means that you're in an estrogen dominant situation. It could mean that you're going to have problems with fertility, all of that. Um, for testosterone for males, if your serum T is hyperactive, you're going to have a really low, low T. If your testosterone um, C1T enzyme is running very high, then it's going to do that. If it's running very low, your testosterone level is going to go through the roof, and you're going to have tremendous amounts. Does that affect behavior? Well, super high testosterone makes people really aggressive and angry. So, again, you're getting the idea how this interacts. Patients do things back and forth. Now, while we wrote this book, we wrote this book on the basis of everybody was coming in and talking about this, that, and the other thing. And what I would like to introduce with my co author, um, she basically had a methylation problem when she was young and had tremendous amounts of symptoms. This is some of her gene panel of some of the methylating ones that you can see. Um, she has an MTHFR, but she also has a BHMT. She has a CDS and a CTH. When you look at that, what that's telling you is homocysteine has no place to go. Can't go anywhere. So it's going to build up. So does that mean there's going to be a higher history of heart disease? Possibly. Does that mean there's going to be problems with the neurotransmitters? Yes. Does that mean there's going to be a hormone problem? Yes. All of these things will be what your patients are going to experience simply because these genes are off. When you look down further, you see CHAP and PEM. These are two other genes, okay, that happen to affect, they're made in the methylation pathway, or should be, if the CBS and CTH genes are working. And what they do is control phosphatidylcholine. And choline, as everybody knows, is one of the main neurotransmitters in the brain from acetylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine also helps your liver and causes your liver to turn around and basically helps in detox and protecting the cells. It's effective for membranes in your skin, membranes in your mucous membrane panels, all of those. So you see people with these genes, dry skins, things of that nature, memory problems, um, all of that comes from that. 
and they have and they have this model mean oxidase. And what it does is controls the breakdown of dopamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline, serotonin, histamine. Um, it's also responsible for phase one detox and phase two detox. So you're talking it's a plethora of things. If these are jammed up, it's a problem. In her case, she has two sets, an AOA and an AOB. NDPF3 basically controls vitamin B6, how it stays in your system. If your NDPF3 is running very low, your vitamin B6 levels drop out very fast. These are people who need an extra supplement of vitamin B6 because they're never going to hold on to it. It's never going to stay in your system. And it can drop massive amounts or slightly, depending on what variant you have. So looking at all of these created a lot of issues in psychological, biochemical, hormonal, all of these pieces. I'm going to have Michelle tell you a little bit about what it felt like to be that person and to have those defects. And, well, I should just add this in here, and I'm sorry if you're any crazy. Uh, once she had been telling her doctors that she had a methylation sulfur defect, and they were all, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Didn't listen. <coughs> And then one day the doctor gave her a urinary tract infection, Macrobit. Macrobit shuts down your methylation. And in doing so, within three days she was covered in hives, within a week she was yellow. Um, her liver enzymes, the normal was 0 to 40, they were at 1900, 1500. Her bilirubin, which is usually less than 1.2, went up to 22. So they nearly killed her with that simply because her methylation sequence was not taken into consideration. And that's one of the important pieces. You see, I'm running really heavy to me time here, sorry. So I'm going to let her speak a little bit, and then we'll take some questions at the end, and we will be over on the hallway with the book. I'm not a doctor, I'm a teacher. Um, I have a question about the vitamin D deficiency. Got to push the arrow down on the computer. No, that don't work. Go to the computer and do the down arrow. Teacher doesn't know how to work. That's it. Down arrow, yeah. Aaron. I'm Michelle Angusano, and I am basically a walking case study for all of you. Um, I became a patient of Dr. Doolin when I was 24. I just turned 54 in May. My life consists of um, every day looking at my food as if it were a plate of chemistry. I wrote Methylation Madness with Dr. Doolin as a way for me to help other people like me who grew up with a family filled of people who had um, quick anger, they had severe migraine. Um, a lot of hormonal issues. My mother had miscarriages. My sister um, had severe endometriosis, and I lost um, my menstruation cycle when I was 36 due to premature ovulation failure. Writing Methylation Madness inside the Mystic Biochemical and Personalized Hypermethylators is my way and Dr. Doolin's way of, of sharing my life story and um, his biochemistry and, and genetics to help you with your patients and your patients hearing my story. As a child, I was always someone who was severely anxious. I was afraid to, when I was, I wasn't even like able to speak according to my mom. I wasn't, I would be at a couch in my room and I, I wouldn't sit on the couch because it has like just like a rust stain or it's an old couch. I, I, as I was able to verbalize how I felt, it was as if the, um, that stain was gonna suck me in. Um, I was unable to, uh, um, as time went on, I was working in Manhattan and I was unable to ride trains. I was convinced that somebody was living underneath my deck in my apartment. My anxiety, became so heightened that 
spastic colon, a nervous stomach, I had psychological issues, you name it, I was, I was it. I had my, my suitcase filled with different um, diagnoses. So I now have a biochemically balanced system. My life is, though I have, I, I, I do not have anxiety, I do not have panic, I do not have OCD where I have to keep going back and forth to my house to make sure that my garage door was shut or to make sure that everything was turned off on a stove. Um, I still have, you know, every once in a while, I'll feel like eh, when I'm driving over a bridge um, or if I'm running late or, you know, I feel like I need to make sure that everything is in order. But I'm not, I can call myself crazy. I'm not that crazy thought person anymore. Um, I used to have a, and I still do, I'm Italian. I, I have a hot temper, but my hot temper is not just, I just don't last, you know, if, if, if someone says something wrong to me, I would go from here to 80 in a minute, not violence or anything, but just like her. Now, being that my chemistry is balanced because I was able to figure out the genetic aspect of what was wrong with me, I now, I'm a holistic meditation coach, I'm a rape healer, so I'm really, really, I'm a calm person. Um, when I was, I guess about 11 years ago, um, as, as Doc explained quickly, I had a urinary tract infection and they gave me macrobid and as Dr. Jung said, it shut down my methylation chemistry. I was basically the color of these walls. Um, I, I was just so severely ill and ironically I was here 11 years ago and it's kind of like, you know, he took me and he's like, let's see what else we can do and we walked around and people were like, ooh, you know, you're not well. But now, since then, my, my chemistry kind of crashed. So we needed to start all over again to rebuild my, my biochemistry because I was great and then I crashed. My voice actually is two octaves lower than what it used to be. I've lost hearing, I have hearing aids, I've lost hearing, uh, I have 30% hearing in my right ear and 90% hearing in my left ear. Um, my hips hurt more so, even though I'm 54, you know. But all of that was a causality of the um, methylation issue with the, with the map of it. So when I wrote the book after I got sick with Dr. Doolin, he wanted me to speak with other hypermethylators because even though I was with him for so many years as a patient, I didn't technically know So I spoke to um, four people who have methylation issues and it was kind of like a kumbaya. You know, I, I would talk to these people and they would say, oh yeah, I had anxiety and oh, my parents had, you know, had migraines and oh, I have body pain. And one thing about when my sulfur cycles as well as the other hypermethylators, methylators who I call my, my sulfur sisters at this point, um, we experience body pain. So when our sulfur cycles and it drops low, I was also diagnosed with fibromyalgia. I do not have fibromyalgia. My, my, my adrenaline fires high and then it goes low, and then it fires high and then it goes low. So it's like every three to four months, I would say that my hands begin to hurt terribly, my legs hurt terribly, my body hurts. And these people who I am I'm close with at this point, they have the exact same thing. I could call them up and say, hey, you know, Janet, do you have a migraine today? And she says, well, I didn't have it today, but I had it yesterday. So 
the relationships to, to all hypermethylators, or most, I can't say all, but most hypermethylators, these people who are undiagnosed, they just, they were like me, all of them. And, and you don't recognize, wow, you can actually just make yourself feel better by throwing down some coconut if, if your adrenaline is too high, you cut your sulfur down. So my food and supplement program, I, I eat a very, very low um, sulfur and methionine diet. I balance, like I started, I, my, my, my plate is basically a biochemical enigma. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll say, okay, I need, I feel a little this way, so I'm gonna eat a blueberry here, or, or I'll, I'll take some, um, some coconut, I love coconut. I, got, I have to eat my coconut. I eat about a tablespoon of coconut milk ice cream a day because I need to keep my adrenaline at a steady, you know, uh, level. I have to watch everything that I do, including um, tanning lotion. So, just here the other day, I've had tanning lotion on my entire life, and. I, I'm not a big tanning lotion person. I'm one of those, I'll just, you know, dry in the sun. So I put tanning lotion on outside here, and all of a sudden, and this happened before, I was so itchy, I, I couldn't even explain to you the itchiness, and being that, you know, my doctor was here, I, I, I said, I don't know what's wrong. Like, what's wrong, and do I need niacin, you know, too high, and what, what's going on? And um, I looked at the back, and he looked at the back, and it was, it was methyl, 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 methyl. Everything was methyl. Methyl and I do not get along. I could go to a lavender field with my daughter. I live out on Long Island, out east. It's a beautiful lavender field out there. I have to literally, I went once, and I'll never go again. I have to mask my face up completely because Lavender, methylates, not good for me. Drinking wise, if I want to have a cocktail, I have to have potato vodka, Chopin potato vodka. Um, I have to, I can't, I, I cannot take any medication either. And the the individuals who I interviewed for methylation madness, they are the exact same way. Medication, and ironically, coincidentally, or genetically, let's call it, my dad, my dad is so severely sensitive to medication as well. So, methylfolate, I speak to many people online, um, on different, you know, Facebook pages and, and things like that to help, and I see so many times, oh, I have, you know, this, 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 I'm, I'm gonna take some methyl first, they, they, they're not even being treated. You know, they, they kind of are just doing it themselves and my heart just like skips a beat because I'm um, like, no, no, no. Do you know if you're a hypermethylator? Do you know if you're a hypomethylator? And, and my, my heart goes out to them because they, are, they have all the symptoms that I have, and except at a pace of, you know, 30 years ago, how I used to be. And methyl fully just, Anything methyl, look at the lotion I put on. It just, it, it's, I, I can't impress upon people to just figure out what your genetics are. Truly understand your genetics and then understand that biochemistry part of your body. Get the right foods in, you know, and, and, and take the right supplements knowing what your chemistry is because of your genetics. I quickly went over coconut. I need coconut constantly um, in order to keep myself level. Um, does anyone have a question? Because I think that's good. I think I, <laughs> yes. How did you get a diagnosis of where you are genetically? Genetically? Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll answer that one. Um, <laughs> We use, a, there's a lot of different gene systems you can use. The best one I found that you have to work real hard on it, but it's a, a company called genomeitall.com. Yeah, 
G-E-N-O-M-E-I-T-A-L-L.com. What they do is they, they will do the standard cheek swab and everything, and they'll send back a PDF, and it'll have somewhere between 800 and 1,200 pages of genes. Now, you can go and look through it, and you can do a search through PDFs, and you can come up with different gene sets and see what it is. A lot of the genes that are in there are genes that you're not going to want to bother with, you need to pick and things, you're not looking for those kind of diseases. But it will show you MAO, it will show you COMT, it will show you all of the genes that are related to metabolism. And in seeing that, it gives you an idea of what the person came in with, and then you can basically look at that and say, okay, they got this gene, they got this gene, they got this gene. Look, they got every MAO gene, they're all running below. Maybe I should give this person B2. Things like that is what you can glean from that kind of test. It's not super expensive. I think it's about 350 bucks. That's about it. So we'll be outside. We have some books. If you'd like to look at the books or purchase a book, um, we oh, thank yeah, you more questions. for coming. This is a heartfelt subject for me. And I hope having me here, as well as Dr. Doolin explaining, kind of gives you a little bit more of a insight to other, to your patients. What food is number? I'm sorry? Food is number. Food. Oh, we're out the hallway outside um, as you walk into the exit uh, exhibit. We're kind of in the hallway. How much are the books? $20. <laughs> Thank you.